Welcome to another episode of The Rabbi and the Shrink. This is Dr. Margarita Guri, your shrink, and my favorite rabbi, Jonas and Golson. Well, the rabbi and I are going to address an issue that is hard for people to think about and face. It's fear. It's been quoted as the culprit for many of our bad choices and as the hero in motivating many of our uh, good choices. Rabbi, let's start off with you. Tell us about fear and ethics. Well, there's a um, there's an expression I heard. I'm sure you've heard it. I uh, don't know where it comes from, but they see fear as an acronym. I think it's false expectations appearing real. <laughs> no, I haven't heard it. I think I got it right. Um, but the um, you know another one of our great um, philosophical works, uh, the Path of the Just by Rabbi um, Moshe. Chaim Lutzato, about 300 years ago, he says a phrase that is always stuck in my mind. He says, there is fear and there is fear. And he means there are things that are really scary. If you're, if you're walking through the, uh, the, the jungle and you hear the lions roar, that's a good reason to be afraid. If, you're, if, you're, if your car breaks down in a really bad part of town, uh, that's a reason to be afraid. If a person gets a, a, a diagnosis um, of, a, of a terrible illness, I mean, these are all legitimate reasons to be afraid. And that's one part of the discussion is how do we deal with legitimate fear? But I think perhaps the more relevant part is how do we recognize when we have created irrational fears in our own minds? Because then, we're, we're harming ourselves. We're causing ourselves all sorts of psychological and often physical problems for reasons that are of our own making. And that's where I think we, we, um, we really get ourselves in a lot of trouble, perceiving reasons to be afraid that prevent us from doing things that are in our own best interest. That was, that was very well put. I think, you know, we, we recently did an episode on anger. And one of the things that I know is anger is almost never one of the first emotions. We default to fear. I mean, we default to anger. So let's say we're really afraid. Well, it's easier to be angry than afraid. It feels better, it feels stronger, and it's a reactive response. So let's take fear. I think often fe with fear that's not legit, we're borrowing trouble. The what if, the what if, well, um, as uh, my twin sister is very funny, she'd say, it's not time to be, it's not time to be upset about that. It's not time to worry about that. It's not time to be afraid of that yet. I, the time will come and she'll say, it's not time yet. And I, I think the whole idea of fear is so many of us choose lives that are less than amazing because we're afraid of something, afraid of failing, afraid of succeeding afraid of looking foolish. Well, uh, as our children always tell us, we look foolish anyway, right? Um, so may as well go for it. Um, you never know how foolish and unwise and, um, and uh, uh, ridiculous you are till you have children of various ages and they're very quick to inform you, very humbling and you learn a lot. Once they get older, they realize how brilliant you are, but um, then they have kids. So, you know, the cycle continues. We can't ever... We can't ever get too overwhelmed, but the whole idea of fear is stopping us. And I think that the difference between a real fear and a rational fear is sometimes just the timing and how we plan on handling. Yeah, in my, uh, in my ethics keynote, and this is really, I didn't really completely answer your question previously, but in my ethics keynote, I, I talk about the three enemies of ethics, and enemy yes. number two is fear. Because when we are afraid, you tell them the three of them. Because I, I don't know if everyone see they should see your your keynote. But what are the three? Well, they need things? to see it live. I can't give away the story. In it. Oh well, right. <laughs> they have to do it. So number two is the enemy. Okay. But we'll we'll we'll, we'll get them. We'll get to them eventually. Um, but number two is fear that you mentioned the fear of looking foolish. Um, that's big. I mean, how often do you know as students? Remember, as students, you had a question, you're afraid to ask it because you thought, well, nobody else has asked it. So I must be the only one with that question. And I'm afraid of looking dumb. 
And then if some, then somebody else asks it, and, and there's a sigh throughout the room because everybody had that question. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, their their fear of you know in 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 business, in work, employment. There's fear of exceeding one's authority. There's fear of getting in trouble. There's fear of looking incompetent. If I ask for help. And these are all ways we set ourselves up for failure. Yes. We fail in doing what we're supposed to be doing. And doing what we're supposed to be doing is, is ethical. If I take a job, it's my job to do the job. And that means if I need help doing the job, it's my job to ask for help. And when we're afraid of how we'll look, how we'll be seen, of what might happen, then we are we are not allowing ourselves to do what we're supposed to be doing. And so the answer that I give is that the, the, the secret for combating fear is to fight fear with fear. Because we're only looking at one side of the equation. All the what ifs, if I do X or don't do X, what about the what ifs? The other way, if I default to inaction, if I take the easy path, because the easy path is very often not the right path. And if I can look at both sides, at least what I can do is start to restore a certain amount of, of equilibrium to my decision making. All right, so now I've got two things I'm afraid of. And if they, if they balance each other, now I'm in a frame of mind where I can start looking at them more objectively. And the first thing from the psychological point of view is to ask yourself, what is the truth of this fear? Because some fears are very realistic. So for instance, some workplaces are not psychologically safe. You cannot question things. You cannot point out problems. And you have to have the courage in your own ability to ask, whose fear is this? Is it the company's fear for people to give input? And so I should be afraid because I could get fired if I give my opinion. If so, is there a way to give my opinion in a way that doesn't sound like an opinion, but sounds like their idea? I mean, I, I think we have to ask ourselves, is this me or them? If it's them, you have a whole bunch of different brainstorming. But if it's you, then it's easier to address. Luckily for me, I have a big brother. And so I don't have to worry about being afraid uh, I, of looking foolish or feeling foolish. He, he did plenty of that. So I survived that. Thank you, Joe. I love my big brother. But, you know, knowing what is my capability to look foolish without having to feel too ashamed or too scared that is the first thing how much of it is me um why are we so afraid what are we afraid of i think we're going to find a theme here because it came up in our discussion of anger that it can often be traced back to ego yes i think and so I, and i think that we're going to find a lot of the negative character traits have their roots in ego um, and you have to think about what really is ego and, you know, in Freud's system, ego was a balancing of the what you want, the id, what feels good, what you want in the moment, and then the superego, the shoulds of it all. So ego, you can think about is the practical uh, problem solver, the mediator, but also I think the innovator lives in the ego. So you have to have the courage of going beyond what feels good. And um, you have to go beyond the courage of people censuring you because they say this is not the way it should be, to innovate um, yeah. or to, some, pardon? No, I heard somebody say once, I can't cite the source, but the ego to think of as an acronym for elbow got out. Yeah. And that, again, without getting into theology of it, but the idea that I am accountable to a higher authority or a higher standard or higher set of values, and that in the in the moment right now, when there is this person or this situation, and I'm afraid how people are going to see me, right? That pushes out that sense of higher values, higher authority, higher standards. And that's, you know, it's 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 the amygdala is taking over. And I'm I'm so concerned with what people will think, what people will say. And these may be people I'm never going to see again. They may be people I don't even care about. 
Yeah, I mean, recently I'm I'm training, as you know, from pilgrimage in El Camino, uh, the Santiago in Spain. And recently I bought a big old backpack that's going to carry 20, 25 pounds. So I can do 500, 12 miles if I last that long. Uh, and so I'm training. So even me, this grown up, you know, old lady with the, the silver haired power, I'm putting on this backpack, going to the gym, thinking I am going to look like such a dork. Well, luckily I am a dork. So I already have lots of practice. With it. But even I who've embraced my full dorkiness as a benefit and a liability, both aspects of it. I had to take some deep breaths and say, I'm embracing my inner dork. I'm going to look like a total jerk. And you know what happened? Two people came up to me and said, what are you training for? And we got to talk in. And some of them even kept me company uh, walking. And the people who thought ill of me for, for doing a dorky, dorky thing kept it to themselves. So some good things happened. So Worrying about fear stopping you is normal, but letting it stop you is not so good. So I ask everyone in there, what is your fear right now? What, what fears are stopping you from being the best version of yourself, being the best love partner, parent, aunt, neighbor, best friend, teacher, whatever? What's stopping you and why? And have the courage to look at fear in the face. And look at all of the possible brainstorm. What are all the things you can do with this fear, good or bad? And then choose some that might be not only doable, but that might be of service to you and others. That's what I would ask you to do. Pick a fear and brainstorm. it. Yeah. And, you know, I think two of the most common fears, we look across the board, there's the fear of no. If I ask for something. I won't get it. There's also the fear of yes. <laughs> right? If I get it, maybe I won't be up to the task. And so we live in a, in a kind of limbo where we don't take chances and we don't give ourselves opportunities. And we avoid the pain of anticipating. I should say we, have, we avoid the anticipated pain but we don't allow ourselves to, uh, to get the rewards. We don't. And I think sometimes the rewards are long in coming because we try something and it doesn't work. So effort, one way we can sabotage our effort in the face of any fear is to try just one thing and then let it die. So you have to get up and try it again, get up and try again. But I also think we can create a chorus of advisors that can enjoy our failures and um, help us plan our successes. And, you know, my father would often say at the table, um, what's the biggest mistake that you either did today or saw and um, what, did, what happened with it? And he was trying to encourage us to take risks. Um, you know, it's kind of interesting. So our attitude about failure, um, I vote that you get excited about it and learn from it. And if you don't know what to do with it, call somebody who's wise and positive. So another way we can sabotage yourself is call somebody who is putting us down or is very negative. So pick your advisors carefully. I heard something uh, not so long ago that, that's kind of interesting. I think it applies here. If we think of fear as perhaps a, a form of anxiety. Yes. Um, and there is a physiological reaction to anxiety. There is. Well, apparently it's the same physiological reaction as that to excitement. It can be, yes. So in our own minds, what we can do, they talk about reframing, is that if I feel anxious, I feel afraid, I don't know what's coming. If I can convince myself, I can tell myself that, well, this is an opportunity, an opportunity for growth. It's an opportunity to learn. It's an opportunity to experience the unexpected and try to frame it as something that's worth that's worthy of excitement. So now I'm taking the same physiological response and channeling it in a positive direction where it can become empowering instead of channeling it in a negative direction where it's going to become uh, debilitating. My friend Dave Bricker would say, turn nervous into service. And I, I always like that, that it's true. And um, my coach um, used to say, 
if you're not nervous, you're not ready. That you have to have the hyped up energy because it's your adrenaline. It's you getting ready to compete. Um, and some people avoid competition like they avoid the plague. And um, I think being afraid of coming in second, third, or last is ego. Um, it matters more what we learn with the race or the preparation of it. We don't have to win all the time. I don't know about you, Rabbi, but I, I've got a lot of great experiences of failing and failing greatly. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I, I frequently quote, you've heard me quote Winston Churchill, that uh, his yes. definition of success is going yeah. from failure to failure with no loss of enthusiasm. <laughs> and, the, and the truth is that it's not a failure unless we fail to learn from it. Yeah. And, and if we stop ourselves from continuing the, the journey or if we blame other people, I think those are the only real failures. Yeah. And in fact, at the, um, the recent uh, National Speakers Association, Association conference we both attended, one of the speakers there, if I can pronounce his name right, uh, Michael Cianelli, I believe, one of the directors of NASA. And, and he talked about the, the culture that they had of failure is not an option except it doesn't work because sometimes you fail. Yeah. And so he has reframed it as failure to learn from failure is not an option. That is so much better. Failure. And I think to that's learn just, from it's failure. so, it's so powerful and so wise. And, and so yet relevant. so many people avoid that paradigm by not letting themselves fail. I mean, we all know people who since high school have stopped learning new things. Yeah. They've decided they're done. And if they want to choose a life like that, I think that's to me, uh, obviously their choice, but um, I always wish them well and look forward to them having the, the spark of courage or curiosity that would help them start learning again. Um, yeah, this is a wonderful quote by Theodore Roosevelt, and I don't have it handy, but um, he talks about the difference between the critic and the man in the arena. <laughs> yes. And it was covered with dust and sweat. And he experiences glorious victories checkered by defeat, which makes his life so much more rich than the one who lives in that gray twilight of knowing neither victory nor defeat. And we know that people who've had some experiences of challenges in their life, not only are better problem solvers and critical thinkers, but they have more compassion for others. And therefore they're more likely to create a collection of friends and loved ones that add great value to their lives. So fail and you can actually invite more love in your life. And I think that's a really good motivator to allow ourselves the, the pain of failure over and over again. And surround yourself with people who will support you through your failures Yes, and help you learn the lessons that they teach. Yeah, and too many people try and support someone by blaming other people. Oh, that wasn't you, that was the boss. No, no, no. How did you contribute to the failure? Isn't in every environment there's a way to win? Some environments, though, the only to win is to be unethical. And the only solution is to either try to change the system or try to change the environment that you're in. Yeah, when I was teaching, um, you know, I would never fail a student who was trying. Me neither. I, would, I, was I, might, I might I wouldn't give them a great grade, I wouldn't give them A's yeah. and B's, but I would I would never you you haven't failed if you've done if you put in a good effort. And I, when I had I to fail a student, I would say you earned that F. Yeah. I mean, I used to teach college as well, and some kids would have such curious and creative minds would have learning challenges. And I would create a different curriculum for them. How can they show me that they've learned this if they don't write and synthesize their ideas well? Um, if they're crippled by anxiety and can't do a presentation in front of the class, how can they show me what they've learned? Yeah. And the kids did such a good job of teaching me different ways of uh, showing success in the face of of different learning uh, styles. And the, and the beautiful thing about it is that you have, you not only taught them the material, uh, you not only allowed them to demonstrate a knowledge of the material, but you, you 
you taught them that it's possible to find alternative ways of succeeding when there are when there are um, obstacles that might appear to be um, guarantees of failure. And so yeah. you have helped them conquer the fear yes. of whatever their particular challenge is. And they taught me. Yeah. They taught me more than I taught them, I'm sure yeah. of this. Um, it's always the case. So my question then to all of you in the listening audience is, what fear are you facing right now? And what are all the things that are going to help you use the fear to invite greatness, risk greatness, as my father used to say? And what are the obstacles in your way, including habits, attitudes, mindsets that you have, or maybe negative people that you're inviting into your world? I, I think we, even if they're family, we can certainly put them in a loving area without having them be our advisors. So ask yourself, where's your fear and what you're going to do about it? You have some final words, Rabbi? I don't know. You wrapped that up such a nice bow. I think. We'll, oh, well thank you, that. sir. <laughs> All right. This is the Rabbi and the Shrink, and we've been addressing fear and looking forward to uh, hearing your comments on what are you doing with your fear, what are your solutions, and maybe new thoughts that we didn't present. Thank you, and join us for another episode of The Rabbi and the Shrink. Thank you for listening to The Rabbi and the Shrink, Everyday Ethics Unscripted. To book Dr. Redshu, Dr. Margarita Guri, or Rabbi Jonas and Goldson as speakers or advisors for your organization, contact them at therabbiandtheshrink.com. This has been a Dr. Redshu production.